Today's episode is brought to you by Gem Accessories. Gem Accessories is one of the leading accessory manufacturers within the trading card game space. Known for their deck boxes, Gem also has an amazing lineup of binders, backpacks, and more. Some of our personal favorites include the new KLRZ Icons deck boxes, the Secrets binder, and the Jaguar and Puma backpacks. But don't just take it from us, check out some of these reviews on screen. For all these amazing products and more, be sure to check out Gem Accessories using the link in the description down below or on Twitter at xgemaccessories. Again, the description down below or on Twitter at xgemaccessories. Hello, everybody, and welcome into today's episode of the Top Cut Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast. My name, of course, is Sunny. I am your host. I am here with my co-host, Caleb. Hello! And of course, as we get started, we want to take just a quick moment to thank all of our wonderful sponsors. So a huge thank you again to Gem Accessories, who you just heard at the beginning of the episode. Remember, there is a link down below with a discount code for 10% off of your first purchase. Also, be sure to check out Millennium Threads with the link down below. There is also a link for 10% off any purchase there at Millennium Threads. And of course, check out our wonderful affiliates who are Dragon Shield and tcg player so you click links before you shop on their websites and we get a tiny little kickback it costs you nothing extra to buy the cards you're already buying or buy the sleeves you're already buying and it goes directly into supporting the podcast now also be sure to check out our wonderful local game store etb games in alexandria louisiana they have a website down below and they are of course one of the other sponsors of the podcast now we want to take a moment, like we do every episode, to thank our wonderful biggest supporters, which is the patrons. So our patrons get our, their names right off every episode for those that might be listening for the first time. And of course, let's get into it. So a huge thank you to Cam Yang, Top Cuts, Trouble Sunny, and Caleb, Austin Johnson, Kane Martin, Zyphorus, Yeet the Feet, AD, Blackwing, <clears throat> Silverwind the Ascendant is the best floodgate. Earth Machine, Best Deck, Epi, Has Anyone Actually Read Toy Vendor, HGH Cyber, I Am McLincoln, Mountain Man, Oatmeal Spaghetti, Owen Alvarado, Pig, Quitting the Game as a Floodgate, Sprite Farter. The Top Cut Podcast is proudly sponsored by Mystic Mind, Unbanned Number 95 Konami, Understanding and Reading Are Two Different Things, Virtually Savior's World, Exo Sisters, Best Deck, No Cap. The best part is that it's not just not just Exo Sister, it's X dash O, like going undefeated at a tournament. Oh, XO Sisters Best Deck. That's amazing. That's multi layered. Yeah. Yes, I still play B Troopers. It's a fun deck. Rogue and Tier 2 are the polite terms for a bad deck. Aaron Gardner, Asami, Ashless Chaps, Duty Booty, Dragon Maidenless Behavior, Drink Every Time Sunny Disagrees with Caleb, Fur Hire Dog Turd, Heroes, Pebble Cereal, Jerry Beans Man, King, King Henry, Old Man Red, Pin Code 143, Ray Powell, Slaking It Up, Sunny is a Freaky Worm Guy, and Vampire for All Lines, the only wife who a person should have. Isn't that right, Sunny? I don't know how I feel about, about patron names directly addressing me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit, it's a bit like on the nose. That was the exact phrase I was thinking of, but I didn't know if on the nose was too on the nose. <laughs> So, again, a huge thank you to all of our patrons for their wonderful support. Now, if you want to become a patron, there's a link down below. We have tiers starting as low as $1. And for $5, you get an extra episode every week, except for this week because Caleb had tooth pains. Mm -hmm. So, it's hard to talk with tooth pains. But, Caleb, I think you have those all resolved now, yes? Oh, yeah, for the most part, yeah. Had uh, oral surgery this morning. <laughs> and here we are recording. And here I am. <laughs> So everybody, please, a huge <laughs> shout out to Caleb. Huge round of applause for being an absolute champion and trooper, uh, being very dedicated. Caleb, if nobody says it in the comments, I appreciate you. <laughs> Just don't drink every time we disagree. You'll black out in like 20 minutes. Depends on what I'm drinking. No, I mean like the patron name, drink every time Sunny disagrees with Caleb. Like... Yeah, don't do it. Yeah, if you're listening to this, don't do it. If you drink every time we disagree, you you will not have a good time. Unless you're drinking water, because then you'll just have to use the bathroom a lot. Which is still not a great time. Although you will 
be properly hydrated, which is good. But don't drink too much, because then you'll be overhydrated, which is also a bad thing. Everything in moderation. Yes. <laughs> so, today we want to do kind of a different fun topic. Now, I know that right now we're kind of mired in the depths of tier zero hell. With but, tier lament. Yeah, but the weird thing is it's actually a pretty cool format. So while yes, tier limit and specifically Ishizu tier limit is tier zero, far and away the best deck, and it isn't close. It's not even remotely close. The the deck beats its bad matchups. Like like when you have a deck that's a worst matchup is itself, not because the deck beats itself, but because you just have to be smarter than your opponent. Mm -hmm. It makes for very intense and skillful format but it's nothing but mirror matches so you really have to assess if that's what you're looking for in a format because realistically i think that there is a fair argument to be made that even the most skill intensive tier zero format is not what most people want i, I think that being pigeonholed into playing one deck is not something that's like an inherently fun thing that people want. Not only one deck, one build. Because eventually, yeah. eventually tier zero decks get to the point where it's like, yeah, this is the build. And it, I know that in Zodiac format, which was tier zero, it was... And, and keep in mind, we're going to be discussing things that happened in the time of the game that we didn't play in. Yeah. So from we didn't play from late 2014 until like at emancipator format 2020 mm -hmm. and even then there was nowhere to play so we didn't really play that yeah we didn't really we didn't really get back into playing until what 2021 no it was phantom rage it's well i started going to tournaments a little earlier than you did yeah yeah um <clears throat> but yeah it was like phantom rage time frame the first i built dinos for a little while after team sam x1 won the it was like a, a remote dual invitational the very very first one that they did he won it with dinos i was like that looks cool and so i built dinos it is a really cool deck yes but i did not have the necessary skill set to play the game at a competitive level yet so i built the deck based off of what he had and based off of what he was playing without knowing why he was playing it. Yeah. So, but th that's beside the point. The What we're trying to say <coughs> is we're going to be addressing some stuff that we weren't necessarily in the game for. So... We're probably going to be making some mistakes here, but... Yeah, understand if we do make a mistake here or two here and there, bear with us. This isn't really our number one time that we played the game. Oh, yeah. So... Over the years we've had tier zero formats, like I said, in Zodiac format, it was weird because Zodiac was definitely <laughs> tier zero, but it was different flavors of zoo, which is pretty rare for tier zero format. Pepe, from what I understand, was just pretty much a bog standard list. Same thing with Spiral. Um, I know Teledad was pretty much a, a solved list. Goat format was cookie cutter. You had 35 cards with maybe a five card swing. So... And that's really how the Ishizu tier mirror is. The only the, the only thing that really is a differentiator is um are you playing three Magnumut or two? Are you playing three Druiswarm or two? Are you playing three Rhino Heart or two? Are you playing one Diviner or two? Are you playing Heralds or not? Like that like that's that's the debate. What are your ratios on the Ishizu cards? Yeah. Like that's it. Not even Oh, are you running this card or this card? No, just how many specific of this specific card are you running? Exactly. So it's <clears throat> crazy to me to see when we have these formats like this that we look back on other formats that we said we hated. We look back on them with like rose tinted glasses. Yeah. So today we want to talk about what, in our opinion, would make for the most optimal, fun best possible Yu-Gi-Oh format and I think that we've actually been there or at least very close since I've been back in the game 
we've had a couple of moments where the format might be diverse, but not too diverse, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's less of a, there's so many decks that there's probably going to be one that I will not side against and therefore will lose against. And more of a, there's lots of decks, but I kind, but I kind of understand how I can build my deck to kind of help with that. Right, exactly. <clears throat> so where we're going to start is we're, we're going to talk about, we're going to go down the list one by one of things that we personally want to see out of a Yu-Gi-Oh format. This is the things that we got together before the podcast and talked about and said, mm -hmm. this is it. This is what to us an ideal perfect Yu-Gi-Oh format looked like. If we could just go and choose this and that X and Y and, you know, be able to choose. So the first thing that we're going to start with is I want to format ideally for me personally, your, your number might differ a little bit, mm -hmm. but I want a triangle format, maybe a square format at most, but preferably like a triangle format. Yeah. So something where you have three major decks and one beats the other, you know, A beats B, yeah, B beats a, C, C beats A. Kind of a rock, paper, scissors, tier yes. one. Yes. Where you have to plan for the other two matchups, even though I might have a good matchup against A, I know I need to game plan against C, but A is also a really good deck, so I can still lose, but I need to understand that just because my matchup is better doesn't mean I can't, I don't have to game plan for it. Yeah. So I would say that realistically having that ABC kind of thing is, I think it's a little bit better than the, like an ABCD. Yeah. Because yeah. Like, in like an ABC format, you can always plan to side five cards against each matchup, you know, three for A, three for B, three for the mirror. Yeah. You know? So I think that's kind of where I fall. What about yourself? Um, so I prefer kind of that, like you said, the triangle format. Uh-huh. Uh, specifically triangle but then like but then like for those uh, who are playing the triangle decks then also have to worry about the tier the, the triangle tier one decks have to worry about the triangle not the triangle but the tier two decks as well um but there's usually and i personally prefer two three of those as well uh -huh. so like a total of six decks in the meta right give or take is my preference because then there is some you know, so it's always not the same at three decks all day. Like, early on, you're going to get your matches in of, I don't know, Salamangrate, and then Numeron, OTK, and then you get into the triangle games. Yeah, and, and I can see wanting those other matchups, but I think you'll have those, at this point, you'll have those no matter what at any time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think that even in a format with basically three best decks, you'll always end up with a situation where this there will always be rogue. Yeah, like this random rogue deck has this amazing matchup against two of them. Right. But then can almost auto lose a third one. That's why it's not part of the triangle. Yeah, I think that I think it's interesting when you have formats where let's say let's let's look at edison format right everybody considers edison this great format but to me it's almost a little too diverse ever so slightly and you know exactly what you're gonna see if you go to your locals for an edison tournament right mm -hmm. you're you're i'll tell you what you're gonna see light sworn zombies black wings gadgets and maybe a rescue cat synchro deck oh and dragons and fairies Seven decks. And then you might have the Eight. one one insane person there. The insane person, keep in mind, playing um uh what was the name of that archetype? I just thought Gladiator of, Beast. Yeah, Gladiator Beast. Yeah. Granted, there's like twenty five playable decks in Edison. But my thing is I don't want a format to be so diverse that I can literally never game plan 
but I also don't really want a tier zero format. Even in a tier zero format that's as interactive and skillful as this one is, I don't want that because... Yeah, it's fun at first. I just don't want to be pigeonholed. Not only that, after about a month, it gets boring. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, okay, cool. I get to go play eight rounds of a mirror. Yeah, and then you have people you know, whining and moaning, saying, we need an emergency ban list and this and that. I just don't think it's like a good, healthy place for the player base to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it creates a situation where a lot of people don't want to go to tournaments because they don't want to play eight to eight hours of just the same game over and over and over. Right, exactly. And yes, it's a very skill intensive game. Game state in that situation where it's, you know, eight hours of constant. But the issue is, is eight hours of who can make the fewest mistakes. Which in and of itself is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it gets tiring and it gets boring after two weekends, three weekends, maybe. I, I think this format's got maybe one more solid week weekend of tournaments left in it before people start getting bored with the format. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you really have to <clears throat> just evaluate what you want. But I think you want the rogue decks to basically be on a level where you have a deck that is your rogue decks, your tier two decks are decks that let's say I go back and I replay the format five years or six years from now. I want to be able to look at the rogue deck and be like, you know, I think that this may just have not been solved yet. Yeah. Because that happens with a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh formats where they just aren't solved yet. That That's it. It's not that the format is necessarily a you know a perfect format it's just yeah. that it, it just wasn't it's always moving yeah yeah they never got the chance to actually solve the deck solve the not deck solve the format format uh due to just uh konami had to release more products and stuff had to get banned they had konami had to move the game along as opposed to if people just stayed in that one era right people exactly. start uh, a great example of that, I think, is actually with uh, Solemn Judgment in GOAT format. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because, you know, at the time, people thought Solemn Judgment wasn't that great of a card. Well... With hindsight. And hi a combination of hindsight and people sitting there continue to play in the format as it sure. was to this day. So that format has evolved into this weird triangle of a weirdness. Um, And really, it's evolved past a triangle into almost like an Edison format where there's like 10 playable decks. Yeah, but then like the number one deck is just constantly shifting between three of them because one beats the other, but loses to the third. Yeah, so Weird. Chaos blows out Goat Control, which <clears throat> blows out Warrior, but Warrior blows out Chaos. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like which individual deck is the best is constantly revolving. Yes, for better or worse. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so then people realize, oh, Solemn Judgment is actually a very good card. Even, even in a, <coughs> even in goat format. Right. Again, hindsight and people sitting down to replay it. So right. That, I that think that there's awful. always going to be cards that when you go back into formats and you look at it, you go, "Why was what? nobody playing this?" Or maybe there's a card that people that people are just kind of like, "No, I need this card. I need it." But then it's like, "Do you really?" Right. You know, that was just that was just bad. You shouldn't have played that. That's why I think like I'm fine with a format being a triangle format where the rogue decks and tier two decks are good enough that in hindsight you might say, I don't think this is a triangle format. I think this is maybe a square. I think this deck was actually tier one. They just didn't put X card in there, so it's not quite there. Yeah. Or like this or didn't think of this of this individual um interaction interaction between these two cards they were already running just not right. doing that interaction yes so to me that's i want three decks with a solid pool of tier like tier two decks i want the top three to be definitely like i want them to be definitely the best decks yeah but i want the tier two decks to be playable okay next no ftk boards yes please no just here's a board did you stop me no good game yeah so 
This was my biggest issue with the format of summer 2021. I thought Tri Brigade was a pretty cool deck. The issue was it ended on four negate Opelousa. That was its interaction. I thought Drytron was a cool deck. The issue was it ended on a six negate Herald of Herald of Perfection. On top of some other stuff as well. Or ultimateness. Yeah, I mean <clears throat> six six to seven interactions, but most of them were just negate, negate. Yeah, omni negate. negate. That's not fun. Just Herald of Ultimateness, negate, negate, negate. It's just not fun. To me, it's it, not interactive. To me, it's even less fun than just your opponent. You just staring down your opponent who has like a who has like a uh, almost a solemn judgment there. Um, he has like goes and match, Tikaboo, Ravelry, uh, Imperial Order, and Skill Drain. What's yeah. the difference? Yeah, I think that, I think that, and not even, I'm not even going to say no FTK boards. I just want interactive end boards. I, I don't want an end board that's just solid negates. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you want an end board where the opponent who presented the board has to think on how to use their interactions as opposed to just, yeah, just play this, negate. No, not even thinking about it. Just, Negate, negate. I'm just keep. Listen, whatever the first six things you're doing, I'm negating. Exactly. It's just it's not it's not interactive. It's not fun. So next, I want a bunch of cool interactions. I I want interactions like like existed in. And back in a uh, uh, Sun and Moon era, like f first weekend of the Sun and Moon uh, VGC. This is gonna Pokemon. We're talking about Pokemon, yeah, Pokemon now. For those that yes. don't know, uh, where, where? So at the time, Z moves were a big thing, and the number one Z move type at the time was Water, which caused rain, which gave a bunch of Pokemon buffs because it was raining. So I was running a Gastrodon, which created this weird thing where my opponent didn't want to, who could who would just negate the the move, which made this weird thing where this hilarious interaction where my opponent wanted to hit my Arcanine with water type attacks, but they couldn't because the Gastrodon, and it, it it was like this fun chess game, right? Because of how all that stuff interacted, it was that was fun, but that sort of interaction, I think the Yu Gi Oh comparison or equivalent might be when you have a deck that does something unique in a way that is maybe unexpected or not necessarily intuitive at first but it causes a cool nifty little you know interplay yeah yeah so i think that honestly I'm trying to think of a good example, example of yeah. this, you know, but, but just a deck that does cool things, which is one of the things that we have on our list is cool decks. You know, I, I don't want decks that are pee pee poo poo garbage. I right? mean, cause there are a lot of cool decks that are around, but no one's going to play them. Cause why would I play this really cool deck when I can play the tier zero deck? Of course. Of course. Yeah. So, I think that Ooh, a good example of a of a silly of a silly interaction is uh, specifically against Marenses and Zalantis. So for those who do not know, Marenses is a link is a standard cyber link climbing deck that are based around water monsters. They don't care about the cyber type, they care about the water attribute. That's the big thing they care about. For the most part. Yeah. So a lot. So as you're going through your combo lines, they actually have cards that will like let you resummon stuff. Whatever doesn't matter. The important part is that some of them lock you into only, into where only you you can only special summon water type monsters. Okay. So if you go into Zalantis while your opponent's got a bunch of monsters on board and you activate his effect to blink the field, mm -hmm. so banish everything and bring everything back, you're the one who's bringing everything back. But you're locked into only summoning waters. So your opponent doesn't get back anything that wasn't water. That's so stupid. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then, of course, you can always also just kind of do like a weird goes and match thing or rivalry warlords thing with Zelantis. But that's the interaction I'm talking about because that's like this niche interaction that I don't know of any other deck that can do that. Not that specifically. <laughs> Another, a cool interaction. How about this? The way that some of the Zodiac cards interacted with the Tri-Brigade engine. Yes. So yes. the Zodiac cards would turn on the Tri-Brigade engine, or the Tri-Brigade engine could turn on the Zodiac cards. Because they're all Beast Warriors. Right, exactly. Just little niche things like that, to me, set apart the... They can set apart a format by making it unique. I know that hat format is a an extremely popular format and a lot of that is because of the cool niche interactions within the decks a good example would be soul charge might be amazing in sylvan but it might not be quite as good in this other deck over here right so i i think that that's one of my favorite things about yugo's interaction mm -hmm. and having those cool interactions in those cool decks are just so critical to a healthy game yeah. state. Oh, uh, one interaction that you uh, just, you just reminded me of was Soul Taker with cards that can miss timing. Yeah, for yeah, sure. When that was revealed as just a thing you could do, it was wild. I mean, I remember the first time it happening, I was playing Chaos Strike and someone soul took my uh, like Pulsar and I was like, man, that sucks. Yeah, that was rough. So, I think the <clears throat> next thing to talk about is... <clears throat> I do not want a format that has a ton of floodgates. Oh my god, no, please no. Yeah, it's just it's not it's not fun. Like let's let's be honest here. Now I can understand self not self, but like card imposed limitations. <clears throat> um such as the Marin says water locking you. Yeah, that's, that's that's not a floodgate per se. Yeah. It's a floodgate like effect on yourself, but that's just part of playing the deck. Right. As opposed to, hey, um, you can only play light monsters now. Oh, what's that? You're a fire deck? Say lovey. My thing is, <clears throat> over the summer, the entire format devolved into yeah. just run whichever floodgates <clears throat> you could run. Fluanderies is playing the barrier statue. Sword Soul is playing rivalry and anti spell fragrance. A lot of decks were playing rivalry goes in and or anti-spell right some decks are playing tikaboo some decks are playing this some decks are playing that and every deck wants to play these all these different you know all these different floodgates and you know mystic mind obviously running yeah. rampant so these decks are playing all of these floodgates and it truly just makes you not want to sit down at the table yeah because you never know when all of a sudden I can't play the game. Right. And you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. Yeah. So no floodgates, I think is really important. I, I don't mind a control deck, but I don't want floodgates to be the reason. And like, even if you do have floodgates, keep them at a maybe one per deck. You know what I mean? Where it's like, oh, that deck can just so happen to run goes and mash, so you have to deal with that once at once a tournament. And if you're looking for a control deck that doesn't run floodgates, look no further than right now we have Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. Labyrinth is a solid control deck that has no issue not running any floodgates. Yep, the only floodgates that they do run, if they do, is End of Anubis. Sure. And the Dark Barrier Statue, who isn't good. Yeah, because there's so many dark cards in the format. Exactly. Um, well, technically, Invader of Darkness too, but what he would the deck he would floodgate's been power crept out, right? Because he would floodgate uh Mister Mister Rune, I think it was, with all the quick play spells. Yes. Yeah. It he only that's the only deck he floodgates. So, <clears throat> in addition to no floodgates, I want few to no sacky cards blowouts whatever you want to call them so i think about cards that single-handedly swing the tempo of a game right cards like called by the great 
evenly red re matched evenly matched red reboot even i think you can even call triple tactics one these these singularly powerful blowout cards that just transform the game state into a wildly unfavorable position for no reason other than sorry they drew it well, with triple tack, it's a case of, sorry, I drew it, and you activate a monster effect during my turn. It's your own fault, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's <clears throat> definitely your fault for activating a monster effect on my turn. So. Um, I want, I want cool decks. I don't want dog water, boring decks. You know, by, by month four of Virtual World, I was tired of it. Yeah, I was yeah. tired of seeing it. <clears throat> oh, yeah, no, no. Which is why I really enjoyed, like, the last format, because there were so many different decks to play. Like, there I was hated a... last format. At first, I really liked it just because how many decks there were, but I hated that Mystic Mind was everywhere. Yeah, if I can respect that. <clears throat> if, if exactly Mystic Mind was gone. And Artifact Scythe. <clears throat> yeah, Mystic Mind, if Mystic Mind Scythe hadn't been a thing, I think last format would have been a blast. Potentially. Um, but I mean, there was a uh, there was a point where I didn't know what deck to play. Yeah, you spent a long time bouncing. Yeah, uh, between Labyrinth, Marincess, uh, there was a short stent there. I was like, I have almost everything to build D-Link. I need like two cards, and they're cheap. Rebuild D-Link. Yeah, rebuild it. Because I, I still had 90% of my stuff for I was like, ah, should I do that? You know, I was like, I, I don't know what to play anymore. Why is D-Link still a playable deck three years later? Oh, because Konami keeps releasing generic dragon and or dark light stuff. It's insane. Specifically, the generic, yeah, banish a dragon, do this. Or if you control a dragon monster, do that. How about Bestial Magnemite? In the end phase, it adds any dragon dragon monster. Yep. I'm just going to add my 11 here, if you don't mind. Unreal. Banish three light. All right, so what are some of these <clears throat> idyllic, you know, triangle, <clears throat> good, diverse formats in Yu-Gi-Oh? Well, I know if, like, okay, so, like, the only, to me, though, the only triangle format that comes up when people ask me about it is, unfortunately, Dino Rabbit and Zector uh, wind up. Wind up. Sure. Which was which was a triangle format, but not quite what we're looking for. Because yeah, there are other decks in the format. They weren't winning anything though. Not not even not even a little bit. I mean, on a rare occasion, you you'd see them in like a top thirty-two list near the bottom. Yeah, but that's about it. So, to me, a good diverse format. Is something like Shadal B. A. Cleaford. Okay. And it, I, we were not around here in that format, unfortunately. We were not. But my understanding is Burning Abyss beat Cleaford. Cleaford beat Shadal. Shadal beat B. A. So the reasoning here is B. A. was able to clear Cleaford Towers. Okay. Shadal could not. So the Cleaford Towers would just kind of shrug at Shadal and they'd lose. Pretty much. Okay, okay. The Shadal deck had a good matchup against BA because of Construct and Winda. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Construct being Construct and not letting your opponent control anything that was special summoned. It'd be a yeah. shame if it was to just get attacked over. Yeah, so Construct <coughs> really was rough on the BA matchup. Uh, I want to say there was a couple of other factors in there, but that is the biggest one as far as I'm aware. I mean, should all fusion is also a thing. <clears throat> and uh, that, and if I recall correctly, BA was a deck where they wanted to have an extra monster sitting there, which turn should all fusion into fusion summon from your extra deck. Yeah. Yeah. So literally you, so literally just take whatever two monsters you want out of your deck and put them in the graveyard. Oh, look, they're both sent there by a card effects. And now you're getting, Effects off because one of them is going to be a shit all. So whatever their shit all effect is, you're going to get off. Right. 
And then, you know, whenever I was playing uh, Pure Shit All for a while there, uh, you know, I would also send, like, a uh, Trick Clown to search uh, Damage... No, I'd send a Damage Duggler to search Trick Clown. Yeah, something like that. And so, through the act of me activating that card, losing one card out of my hand, I'd add, I'd end up adding two back to my hand. Right. It was ridiculous. Another cool format that I think qualifies for this is toss format. So toss format is inherently a four deck format, right? You have Thunder Dragon, Orcus, Sky Striker, and Salad. But as you get later on into the format, you start seeing more of a, and granted the format was like a year long with three to four ban lists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you end up seeing this kind of hybrid Orcus Sky Striker deck, which was really gr nuts. It was gross, disgusting. Hmm. And it just, it just made it into a triangle format. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how much more you need. It, yeah, it was a square format that got shifted into a triangle format. And yeah. From what I understand, though, it was a very fun format. A lot of people really love Toss format. A lot of people love going back and playing toss format. I've never played it, but mm -hmm. now I know that there's a format with ABC in it as well, like ABC Paleo and, and another deck. That was a triangle format that a lot of people talk highly of. I know there was a <clears throat> format where Cosmo was around and <laughs> Cosmo. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what the other two decks were. I think one was maybe Monarchs and something else. But essentially, the best deck was Cosmo or something right there around it. But you still had a couple of other tier one decks. So the representation was never very hot. It was never like disproportionate, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now... I think that that is pretty much all that we talked about. So just a quick little recap. We have that we want it to be preferably a triangle format, but a diverse one. No FTK boards. Lots of cool interactions. Very few floodgates. Few sacky cards or blowouts. Cool decks. And do you have anything else to add? Uh, nothing I can really think of off the top of my head. I got you. Now, I think it's time that we do a few mailbag questions. What do you say? Yeah. All right. So, oh man, I gotta, I gotta find where we stopped last time. <laughs> All right. And you, what is your opinion on the Yugo game Duelist of the Roses? It is one of my favorite games on the PlayStation 2. I've never played it. It is my number. It is, if not my number one, it's in the top three of my most favorite games that were ever produced for the PlayStation 2. Wow, that's high praise. Mm hmm. I loved that game. I spent, I, it's probably one of the first games I spent a thousand hours in. Hmm. I recently replayed it. Actually, I recently replayed through it. Uh, rec I recently replayed through it, but it was modded to be even harder. Sure. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> I'm speeding down the highway and a cop sees me. Before the cop could pull me over, another car went way faster than me and the cop pulled him over instead. Did I just chain block the police? Mm, no, because you didn't make the other guy speed. He chain blocked the police from you. Fair enough. All right. Let's see here. I know I got more questions. Uh, what is your opinion on tier two and rogue decks? I think they're fun, but it really depends on the individual meta. Sure. And it depends on the individual deck as well. And what you want to get out of the deck, it's going to depend a lot on <clears throat> the individual and a lot on the user. Yeah. Uh, a great example is Morincest is, I think, a really fun deck. Right. Absolutely. And, and that will always be... The most important thing is your enjoyment of the deck. Yeah, yeah. Whether it be competitively, you know, going to regionals and remote dual regionals or playing on 
IRL, you know, uh, I think that no matter where you go, you should be able to go in with a tier two a rogue deck and have fun because that's yeah. the most important thing. So, uh, what cards do you think will end up getting hit on the Ishizu tier deck? I have no earthly clue how they're going to hit that thing. Because, like, all the normal tier monsters are all hard ones per turns anyway. Right. So, hitting any of them to one doesn't do anything. I disagree wholeheartedly, 100% without a doubt. Well, I was about to say, except uh, decrease the... What's the word I'm looking for? The per like the percent chance of you actively milling it or drawing into it, right? Consist right. It it all you can really do in that situation. It all it does is reduce the consistency. But is that enough? No. <clears throat> you need to limit Havness. <clears throat> specifically, Havness. Havness is the one that's rough because he can special summon himself from the hand <clears throat> and mill. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. Havness is the best one. Havness needs to go to one. The field spell needs to go to one. Honestly, probably Kit Kalos needs to go to one. And personally, I think that all of the Ishizu cards need to go to one. If not banned, because they're broken. I think one on all of them would be fine. Yeah, the yeah. issue with a deck like that is you run <coughs> out of, like, you need to have a critical mass of these names. Yeah, yeah. So being short even one name is pretty rough it can be but we'll have we'll, we'll have to see we'll have to wait hopefully we'll have to wait and see and hopefully see what they do hopefully soon right favorite normal monster Ooh, my favorite vanilla um so i have two favorites okay one of them is magnot avram's check this out yes another one of my favorites is gun is the gunkin sioux ship I was just thinking about the Sioux Ship cards. Because its flavor text is just... Amazing. It's just it's literally just a uh, sushi uh, review. It's so good. Four out of five stars. It's a four-star monster. It's a level four monster. It's great. I think if I had to pick a favorite normal monster... I just, I just always come back to thinking about um oh gosh i'm losing my train of thought it's so late yeah uh, who's who's me what hitatsumi giant no no beaver no. warrior who wasn't a beaver what are you talking about he was definitely a beaver beaver warrior wasn't a beaver <laughs> he's a rat not a beaver Oh, folks, he's Googling it. Yeah, look at that rat tail on that beaver. Hey, he got into a car wreck. He had to get a <laughs> transplant. He's having a rough life. It's definitely a beaver. <laughs> beaver warrior is a rat. You're a rat. Man. Uh, but yeah, beaver warrior, Tori, Griffor, Gazelle, King of Mythical Beasts. I think for favorite normal monster, I think I might have to go Flame Swordsman. That's fair. I like I like Flame Swordsman a lot. If it's not Flame Swordsman, it would, he's a cool dude. Oh, you know what? Actually, I know exactly what it is. What was that? Monk of the Tenyi. Fair. Fair enough. Monk of the Tenyi, definitely. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> What archetype has the most unique play style to you? Unique play style. So when I read this question, my very first thought was Earth Machine. But that's not really an archetype, right? It's, yeah, yeah. It's more of a homogenous pile that just so happens to all work together. Exactly. Maybe Cubics. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of interesting. Um, Time Lords. Hmm. Yeah, they're 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 kind of wonky. Hmm. It's really hard to put your finger down on it and say exactly exactly what you'd call it. Yeah, but then you also have like the ghost rix mechanic, which just 
really suits their uh their uh Ludo narrative. Yeah. Where they're where they we know where you set them and then they jump out and go boo and then go back down. Right, right. Which is hilarious. Uh what is your guys' take on Konami not crediting artists? Oh, I think it's awful. Yeah, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Now, I will say there is something to be said for anonymity, a not anonymousness, a not and anim- I have it right the first anonymity. Time? Anonymity. That's it. There is something to be said for anonymity. You know, if somebody doesn't like the art on a card, wherever, they're not going to go harass the artist. Yeah. Which is which is inherently a good thing. But I think in a world where we assume the best of people, which we probably never should, but in a world where we do, I think that you should be crediting the artist. That way they can promote their work, have it out there, and let people know, hey, this right here, I did this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, because like with Magic the Gathering, there's been there's been several people whose artworks who started working at Wizards doing the artworks for the cards who ha- now have artworks in like museums and stuff. Wow! And only got there because they they can point at, hey, I did this artwork for Magic the Gathering. Yeah, for sure. Actually, there's some of them, some of those arts you can, you, that you can go to their web, uh, not their website. Yeah, some of them have websites you can go to and order artwork from them. Hmm. That's nice. Hmm? It's really, it's really cool. Yep. All right. Next, we have... <laughs> Why are some black wings naked while others wear clothes? Uh, okay. So, I think... I actually, ha- I actually have a conspiracy theory about this, okay? Okay, I'm here for it. Okay, so... I think so. I think the way black wings work is that it's not just birds or okay. bird people. I think they're on a sliding scale of bird, just a dude in a bird suit, and all of them are on or on a they're on that range somewhere. The more naked ones being on the end of the bird suit, because a dude in a bird suit because. They're already wearing clothes. It's a bird suit. What if they're all wearing bird suits? Well, no, because some of them are just straight up birds. Like what? Like Blizzard the Far North. Nope. It's a really big suit. You don't have anything else in that picture for scale. That is fair. But some of them are very obviously or Mr. with Silver Shield. Uh, there's uh, Again, nothing for there, scale. There's a handful of them that are just scaleless. <laughs> All Yu-Gi-Oh cards are scaleless. Not pendulum monsters. <laughs> You're not wrong. Oh, I, oh, I can't believe I got you with that. <clears throat> but oh wow. Back to back to my conspiracy theory though. So I think what it is is that the ones that are wearing clothes are more on the actual just straight up a bird, and the ones that aren't are more on the doing the costume because they're already wearing a costume so they don't need the extra clothes and also there are absolutely Yu-Gi-Oh cards that have pers- pers- perspective no it- banana for scale I guess perspective is the word there there are Yu-Gi-Oh cards that have that perspective where you can definitely tell the scale oh yeah for a great examples that is that in the background of the card artwork for El Shadal Construct is El Shadal Window right the issue is that there's no scale for how big El Shadal Wind is. <laughs> what if they're all huge? Um, Actually, we do know how tall Construct is. Okay. 60 stories tall. No shot. Yeah. Where did you hear this? Uh, I think it was in one of the dual terminal storyline thingies. Let me re-Google that. That's crazy. That's a crazy number you just gave me. And I hope that it's right. Cause but that's a crazy number. Oh, I was wrong. It's 15 stories tall. That's still super tall. That's still like close to 200 feet. Mm-hmm. That's wild. All right. Last question we got here. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Classic. Solid question. Okay. I have an actual answer here. But I want to hear yours. I want to know where this is going. So I want to say I would say the egg because of the way because at what point okay so first off you have to define when the proto chicken became a chicken right and whatever that line is that first chicken that egg 
that hatched the first chicken. But first you have to define the line between the thing that came before the chicken and the chicken. It's kind of the problem there. Okay. Okay. To me, an egg came first. Why? Because when I think of the question which came first, the chicken or the egg, I don't mean this individual chicken or this individual egg. I mean the concept of eggs or the concept of chickens. That's fair. If you're talking about just the concept of an egg, the con uh, yeah, egg. It was egg, definitely, by many, 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 many tens of millions of years. Oh, yeah. Who, who knows how many species have been birthed and gone extinct that all used the egg system. <laughs> listen, listen. There's only a certain number of systems you can go by. Budding, That's egg, true. and live birth. It's something like that. All right. Well, hey. Today's a shorter episode, but... <clears throat> Go ahead, get on into your weekend, enjoy yourself, and we want to, of course, thank our sponsors again. We want to recommend everybody join our Discord server, check out our Patreon if you are so inclined, our affiliate links, and until next time, have a great week, everybody. Take care, everybody.